Let's start. Uh, welcome to the session Bytecode Partner Matching. My name is Evgeny Mandrikov. Um, another name of this session is, on some conferences, it was Java 4 till 11, Kotlin, Code Coverage, and their best friend Bytecode. So as you might guess, we're going to talk today about Java, of course, about Kotlin. A little bit about Code Coverage, but that's not the main point. And we're going to talk about their best friend, Bytecode. There will be some scandals, a little bit of intrigues, a little bit of investigations. So let's start. Before we start, usual disclaimer. Uh, whatever I'm going to say, not really related to the company where I work. Nevertheless, it's a great company, Sonar Source. You might know it by products such as SonarCube. Um, today, I'm going to talk about something on which I'm working uh, in my spare time. Uh, all this comes from my work uh, on Jacoco, uh, on plugin that integrates Jacoco into Eclipse, I call Emma. Uh, a little bit out of contributions into OpenGDK, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a quick check. How many of you ever heard about Jacoco? Wow. Who really writes tests? <laughs> OK. Thank you. Um, let's continue. So during development of those projects, in particular Jacko, we do a lot of testing. We do a lot of testing against different GDK versions, um, against seven and a half, half because we also test early access builds before they come out, before they reach you and other developers. Um, we find quite some bugs. I would say that mostly we find bugs in GDK, actually. Um, sometimes we even contribute patches back to them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sometimes, of course, we add also new features to Jacoco. Um, one of such features that we recently added was filtering. So here is how uh, the code coverage report was looking before we added some features. Uh, this is a code coverage report for some Kotlin classes. Not so nice. One might think out of this report that actually uh, tests were pretty bad. Actually, tests were pretty good. And uh, the real picture looks like this. So we added some filtering. And now the code coverage report is far better. It represents the reality. And so the goal of this talk is to see why we need some filtering. Uh, the same things apply not only on Jacko, the same things apply on any tool that in some way analyzes the bytecode, not the source code, but the bytecode. For example, uh, handbags, the former finbags, uh, even SonarCube itself, uh, p-test, mutation testing, if you use it, all those tools, they work with the bytecode. And there is quite some difficulties, so we're going to have a look on those difficulties. Um, before. Before we look on them, yes, it's, it's important to understand that we do not, and those tools like handbags, they do not work with your source code. They do show maybe what they found in your source code, but the actual process of finding happens out of analysis of class files. On one side, it's pretty cool because, for example, in case of Jacoco, work with class files allows you to simplify the process of integration, process of code coverage measurement. Um, it opens the door for other GVM languages. Hello Kotlin, hello Scala, hello Groovy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, simplifi uh, it simplifies life because you can take any binary, just analyze it, and you would see, for example, code coverage, or, what, or you would see null pointer, the references, if you take handbags. Um, this also helps to support uh, new Java versions if they do not change the bytecode. For example, in GDK, 10, uh, in GDK 12, there will be uh, switch expressions, row string criterials, maybe concise method bodies. All of this does not affect uh, the bytecode generated. It's a pure syntactic sugar. So it should be a no-brainer for, for the tools to support them. Um, pretty much the same thing happened with Travis resources. We're going to have a look on it later. Bam. And before we really start, here is a real disclaimer. Um, you're not so many, so I hope you know what you're doing, uh, why you came here. But still, let me warn you. There will be a, li a little bit of blood out of GVM. If you're not ready, please leave us the room. 
Uh, we will look really into the JVAC, into the Kotlin. We are not going to use Gradle to compile things. Sorry for that. Uh, we're going to talk strong language. We're going to talk bytecode. Again, not ready. Doors are here. And I will try to do intense surveillance of your brain. Sorry for that again. Let's start. Ready? Are you ready? OK, let's go. Java. Um, let's have a look on a pretty simple example. Uh, let's take a look on the empty class. Uh, by chance, the class name is bless me. Why not? Who agrees that this class is empty? Oh, really, it's empty. There is nothing in it. Just curly brace, right? OK, let's have a look deeper. So what we are going to use today is uh, Java compiler, JavaX. So we compile it, JavaX, bless me. And we are, go we are going to use decompiler. We are going to use, uh, let's say, yeah, decompiler. We are going to use Java P standard 2, which comes with GDK, uh, with two options, minus V verbose, minus P, uh, show private members, etc., etc. So we compile it, then we decompile. And what we could see in the compiled version, we could see that, well, it was compiled. Here is a class file. Uh, modification date, checksum, etc. It was compiled with a such source file. Uh, we could see that uh, it was actually produced for the uh, Java 8 uh, GDK. It was compiled probably with uh, Java 8. Why probably? Because, well, you can take Java 9 and also compile for the bytecode version for, for to run it on Java 8. Uh, there is a constant pool. This is probably first and the last time we see the constant pool. Uh, constant pool is basically all the constants that use it uh, in this class file. Uh, this reduces the duplication and also simplifies further instructions because, well, you just need to reference an ID in a constant pool. Um, so it's pretty useless for what we are going to do today, so it, it won't be shown later. Um, and yes, blessed place can't be empty. Uh, someone correctly guessed it, uh, the empty classes in Java is not actually empty because there is a constructor. There is always default constructor. Um, this default constructor also contains the code. Uh, in particular, we need to, in, uh, to initialize objects, so we need to call uh, a constructor of our parent, of super constructor. And of course, none of the methods in Java couldn't fall uh, true into nowhere. They should end either by throwing exception or by returning. So we have a return here. Pretty simple example, right? What we could also see here is a little bit of connection with, uh, with the source code. Why a little bit? Because, well, we have a source file name, but it doesn't contain an absolute pass. It just contains really a file name. No package name, nothing, just a file name. And there is a line number table. Not columns, not offsets, really lines. Line number table basically says, well, line number one of our source file was compiled into instructions that start uh, uh, at offset zero. That's what we see here. Um, so basically, the tools which work uh, with bytecode, which analyze bytecode, this is the only information that could use uh, in order to map back what they found to your, uh, to your source code. That's why, for example, handbags, OK, it could find a null pointer the reference, but it would never show you the exact column of this. It, con it could only say, well, on this line. And if you have a, gr a big expression here, well, somewhere in this expression. Um, let's move on. Now we have another simple example, again, to just a little bit warm up here, uh, because you look sleepy. Uh, we have Yenum. This time, we call it empty to really be sure that it's going to be empty. Who is agrees that this enum is empty? There is no constants in it. Again, just curly brace. I, I agree that this is empty. OK. Who disagree? OK, of course. Uh, we compile it, we decompile it. It couldn't be empty again because we say it, well, every class uh, in Java should have at least private default constructor. So this enum also should have at least this one. Let's have a look. Well, the first thing which we would see is not actually a constructor. The first thing which we would notice is some magic field values. We would also notice that there is a method values, not at all a constructor. We would also notice that there is a method value of. And only then comes a constructor. Um, and also there is an initializer. Why do we have those methods? Well, 
you all know that on enums you could call method values and this method is going to return you all the, uh, all the values of this enumeration. So here is this method. It should exist. Value of, the same thing. You could call value of method on enum and it will give you a value of a constant based on its string representation. Of course, those methods should store somewhere this information in order to give you it back. That's why there is uh, a field values generated. What we could notice here also, this field, well, private, we know this keyword, static, final, synthetic. What is synthetic? We're going to have a look. Remember this word? And, well, initializer does pretty simple thing. It initializes this field values. Well, there was no constant, so there is nothing to put in this field, but if there would be a constant, we would simply put all the values of enumeration into this array. Uh, why is this important for the tools which analyze bytecode? Well, if you're not going to filter those constructions out, if you're not, uh, not going to skip them, ignore them, users would see them in their code coverage wrappers, for example. So in version 079 of Jococo, a user would see such a wrapper. Well, and from there, a logical question, why should I care about code coverage of value of method? This method was generated by compiler. Let's just trust the compiler. Compiler does the right thing. So we should filter them out. We filtered them. Uh, apparently, this wasn't enough because uh, some people use uh, enumerations to, as, as a containers for static utility methods. In static utility methods, there is no enum constant, so enum constructor never going to be called. So this beast also should be filtered out. Well, OK, let's filter this out also. All this is, of course, of course ad hoc approach. So when we not aware of some patterns that we should exclude, we are not going to exclude that pattern. We should be aware, then we could write some filter which based on some properties of what we should filter, filters out. In this particular example, well, we filter knowing that this is enum, that uh, there is value of and values methods. Pretty simple. So, you remember I told you about synthetic. Um, if, if we are going to uh, have a look into our Bible, into Java Virtual Machine Specification. In it, uh, in the chapter 4.7.8, we could find such a paragraph. Paragraph says, well, every class member that does not appear in the source code must be marked as synthetic. So basically, every generated thing by compiler must be marked as synthetic. As in any language, in Java language, there is exceptions. So there is also statements. The only exceptions are, and we've seen those exceptions. Uh, default constructor, class or, in, in class or interface initialization methods, the static initializer, enum values, and enum value of methods. Does anyone has ideas why those exceptions? Well, pretty simple. Synthetic constructions, compiler would never allow you to access them directly. So you could not access this synthetically generated field by writing, well, enum dot dollar uh, values. There is, for, for the compiler point of view, there, there is no such field. You could not access it. Well, it exists, but it's at the same time, it does not. And of course, through reflection, you're going to see it. But from the, during the compilation, you would never be able to link with a method, for example, that was generated. Reflection lets you uncover many other things. Um, why default constructor is visible? Why value, value of and values methods are not marked as synthetic? Well, because those things you should be able to call from your source code. So they're not marked as synthetic. Um, another interesting thing which we could see in, uh, in the specification is that synthetic attribute was introduced in blah, 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 GDK version uh, this one to support nested classes and interfaces. Pretty interesting. Let's have a look. So we have, well, two classes. One is an inner of another one. Um, it has a private constructor. And, well, we call this private constructor from the outer class. Pretty simple, right? So what happens here? Let's have a look. We compile, we decompile. We are looking on the outer class. So we are looking on the place. Uh, again, we see the version. We are looking on the invocation of a constructor. And what we could notice here, well, this is our example method. It's not synthetic. We've wrote it. And here is an invocation of constructor. But apparently, this invocation contains some argument. Specifically, it contains a null. Well, 
our constructor had no arguments. What the fuck? Let's have a look on inner, what happens here. In the inner class, we see our private constructor. There is no arguments in it. What we also could see is that there is a new constructor, and this constructor is generated, it marked as synthetic, and it really accepts some argument. Why so? Well, we also could notice that this constructor is no more private. The thing is, while Java language specification allows you to call private members of nested constructions, Java virtual machine had no knowledge about nesting. Basically, for, for the Java virtual machine, those two classes, they lie next to each other. And, well, one class could not access privates of another class. Super simple. In order to overcome this, well, we need some workaround. So here is a compiler workaround. Let's generate a package local method, and let's, let's basically access the private constructor through this method. Uh, yeah, so it's package local synthetic. Uh, it invokes our private constructor. And this time, if you would look on exactly the type of the argument that this constructor receives, well, this, this time, this class is really empty. You couldn't construct it because there is no private constructor. And this class is marked as synthetic. It was generated. This class is just needed to distinguish two constructors. That's why you need an argument, because otherwise signatures are the same. Pretty simple. Um, let's, yeah. Uh, why I say it had? Because things are changed. Uh, in Java 11, we got an estimates. Uh, you could read more in JEP 181 uh, about nest-based access control. Basically, if you take exactly the same example, but this time we compile it for Java 11, we would notice that there is a loss in weight. There is no more need to generate this synthetic package local constructor uh, because, well, there is a new attribute which says, well, I am nested in this class. So now GVM knows that those two classes they, they are in a specific relationship. One is nested into another. And for this case, we could relax the access rules so that allow outer class access inner class privates. Let's have a look on another example that should be pretty familiar to you, um, accessors. So we have outer class with a private field, we have an inner class, and we increase the value of outer class from an inner class. What happens in this case? Well, I suppose you should guess that something similar should happen. We are not supposed to have a direct access to the private field. Let's have a look. So what happens? Again, Java 8. Uh, if you look into the inner class, here is the place where we are supposed to have an access to the private field, and what we could see, there is no increment. There is some invocation of some method with some weird name, access dollar zero zero eight, thanks God, not zero zero seven. Um, what is this beast? Let's have a look. Well, this beast lies in outer class. It's package local synthetic. It gives an access to the inner class, and indeed it contains increment. That's also why uh, synthetic contribute was introduced. Um, again, if you look on Java 11, we compile the same thing with Java 11, we would notice that there is a significant uh, lost in weight. Uh, there is a new attribute. This time it's attribute nest members, basically saying, well, I am an outer. I have following members uh, which are nested into me. Uh, and in inner class, we again gonna see nest host, which says, well, my outer class is this one. Pretty cool. Um, another example of synthetics that should be pretty well known for you is bridge methods. So we have two classes, one inherits from the other one. We have two methods, but well, signature of one method is slightly different than the signature of the other one. Um, and as you might know, in Java, when you do an invocation of a method, the whole signature accounts for invocation. So basically, when you're saying, well, on a class, on an object of a class A, I'd like to call a uh, method fun which returns an object, you literally say, well, it returns an object. However, at exactly the same place, you might have an instance of class B, which, well, also an instance of class A. So how would you call the method which does not return an object because, well, different signatures. 
So for this case, well, we again decompile. Here we see our original fun, which returns string. And what we could also see is that Java compiler generates specific uh, synthetic method, which now returns an object, which is called bridge, which gives an access to, uh, which basically bridges two signatures. Synthetic bridge, and well, it invokes our original method, simply delegates. So out of all this, uh, you might uh, quickly make a simple uh, conclusion that, well, any tool that works with a byte code should just ignore synthetic methods. That's it. Is it true? Let's have a check. Let's have a look on Java Lambdas. Uh, we have a simple example. We have method run, which takes runable and calls a method run. Well, we pass to this method lambda as an argument. Notice that we have a joker on a line 9. Okay? We compile this, we decompile, we look on exec, nothing specific here. We look on invocation. Where is joker? There is not joker. Fusermo, there is no line 9. Where they are? Well, it's internals of lambdas. It's a little bit out of scope of this talk, but putting simply, Lambdas are compiled into specific methods which are synthetic, which still lie in the same class file, but not in, a, in an original place where you invoke construct a lambda. So here is a joker, here is the body of a lambda, and here is a line number nine. And so if you ignore synthetics, well, you would ignore the complete lambda body, right? This is exactly what happened with us. Well, we said, okay, let's ignore synthetics. So no more coverage for lambdas. Well, we need to fix this. So you start making, again, an ad hoc approach to analyze the bytecode. You, you start saying, well, synthetic, but not lambda. And how you determine lambda? Well, you look on a suffix of a method. If it's dollar lambda, then, well, probably this is a lambda. <coughs> Another interesting example is uh, switch plus plus enum. So you can make a switch by enumeration value. So here is enumeration, true, false, why not? Here is a switch, three cases, false, true, default. Into what this compiles? Let's have a look. Method example. Um, indeed, we have a switch. Indeed, it contains three cases, one, two, uh, and default. Well. We also get some magical class E dollar one. What's this beast? Let's have a look. Um, here we see the access into this class into the field switch map. So let's have a look on this class. Indeed, it's synthetic. It was generated. There is switch map. It's again synthetic. It was generated. There is crazy beast initializer of this field. What happens here is we put in a switch map uh, a value of ordinal of enum constant false. And we say, well, this is going to be associated with one. And we do the same for the constant true. And we, we say, well, this one is going to be associated with value two. Why this is done? Well, we already compiled this. Uh, oops. A little bit slow. Um, we already compiled this switch into, uh, yeah, in, into switch and, and however, this switch, we already compiled it, however, enum constant, you, you might change it. So switch and enum constant, they, they might actually lie into different places. Uh, and if you, if you change enum, the behavior of switch should not change. So switch should operate on some other constants, which, which should be generated dynamically at runtime, uh, depending on which values in enum you actually currently have. And that's why there is generation of this helper class. Um, so again, you need to filter this out. You need to ignore this code because there is nothing in it. At this moment of time, you might start wondering, well, OK, so far you show it as only synthetics. Do, do you have something which is not synthetic? Well, I do not, but uh, in Java compilers there is plenty. So let's have a look. I hope you already warm it up. You s you are catching what's going on. Um, let's have a look on assertions. So we compile a pretty simple example. There is assertion on a Boolean. What happens inside? We get, again, some magical synthetic fields. Assertions disabled. We get some, again, initializer. This initializer does pretty crazy thing. It says, well, 
Field assertion disabled should have a value which is uh, call of a method uh, desired assertion status and we pass uh, a class literal to, to this method. Uh, why we need so? Because, well, if you will have a look on, on an actual code of assertion, the first thing which is checked, if assertions disabled or not. You know that you can disable or enable assertions at runtime. You don't need to recompile your codes unlike in C or C++. You just disable them at runtime. And if each time we will be checking whether assertions enabled or disabled, it will be quite of a penalty for performance. So there is a field which simply caches the value, whether assertions was enabled or disabled for this particular cause. And only then there is, well, the actual assertion and uh, throw new assertion here. So this also needs to be filtered, but we do not know how, so there is an open, open ticket on that. Uh, another interesting example, which is not at all marketed as synthetic, is uh, switch by string values. So here is the switch. It takes a string. It has three cases. Um, what happens in a bytecode in this case? Well, if you would have a look, we would see that there is actually now two switches. Well, how is that? We had one, right? Or am I sleeping too like you? There is one switch. Agree? Why two switches? Let's figure out. Um, the best way to do switch by string is uh, actually do first a switch by hash code. If you do so with high probability, we already would guess uh, into which case we fall. Unfortunately, uh, hash codes, they do have collisions. So after we do a such switch, we, s we still need to verify uh, whether we have expected string or not. And that's why there is also some comparisons. We need to compare with original string. So we also get some branches generated uh, if equals or not. And exactly in this case, we got two strings whose hash codes are exactly the same by chance. So here is verification only when we compare it, whether it's one string or another, only then we know into which switch case we, we, we fall. And only then we could actually execute the real switch. And here it is. So here is first case, here is second case. That's it. Again, you need to filter this. This is far more harder than before because there is no more markers. Um, compiler might generate different code, uh, and this actually happens. Eclipse compiler, for the same thing, also generates comparisons, but does not generate two switches. So in order to work with the bytecode, you really need to adapt to, to particular compiler. If you would like to adapt to many compilers, well, you need to test many compilers and adapt to the many compilers. Um, let's speed up a little bit. Uh, let's have a look on another interesting example, finally. Um, so we have try finally, that's it. Uh, in a try body, we have some call of a method. In a finally body, we have the same call of a method. If you will decompile that, well, we will see Three invocations of no method, but we had only two, right? Let's have a check or three. How many knobs on this picture? A quick slip check. There is three knobs, but well, one is uh, is a method definition, so it doesn't count as an invocation. Uh, in order to help us distinguish in the bytecode, let's let's add some markers. Let's let's pass a string here. So what we now see in bytecode, what changes here? Well. Now we clearly see which one is in body, which one is in finally. So there should be two, right? But what? Why there is two invocations in finally? Let's figure out. Um, in the bytecode, in order to handle exceptions and in order to handle finally block, there is exception table. Exceptions table basically says, well, if exception happened on those instructions, then please invoke this exception handler. And if there is no exception, well, just continue execution. And you know that finally block should be executed in both cases, whether there was exception, whether there wasn't exception. So, well, the best way is to actually duplicate it. So again, you need to deal with this duplication. We deal. A little bit of archaeology. It was not always like that. If you will have a look on Java 1.4 a long, long, long time ago, we would notice that exactly the same source code compiles in a little bit different constructions. There is no more duplication. Um, previously, exception handler uh, 
for the finally block, it was possible to implement it using a pair of instructions, GSR and RED, Java subroutine and return from a subroutine. Um, on exact the same conference, you could catch uh, Nikita Lipsky, and he could explain you why they decided to change that. But basically, uh, GSR and RED instructions are a way harder for bytecode verification, which is done by GVM. So they decided, well, we are going to just duplicate the code. Let's have a look on another example, try with resources. So we have some resource, it's closable. We have a try, and we work with this resource. Super simple. If we decompile that, we are going to see a crazy beast, which which pointless to look at deeper because it's really big, right? You couldn't read it. Um, it contains a lot of calls, closable clause. Why a lot? Well, try with resources must close the resource. So for sure to close the resource, let's try four times, right? No, of course not. There is a lot of null checks, blah, blah, blah. If you will again open Java language specification, Java language specification says, well, try with resources is equivalent to that. Let's check. You might ask, well, prove it that this is equivalent. Um, let's do a quick check. So I do have uh, one source code, which is exactly the one that you seen, try with resources. And I have another source code, which is, well, what you also just seen. If I compile the first one, decompile it, save the result decompilation, if I do exactly the same operation but with the second source code, it also save. And then, if I do a diff between two, the only thing that I'm going to see is the difference in line numbers. That's it. And of course, source file names are different. The rest is exactly identical. So. Let's have a look that there is something else. Well, there is quite a lot of bytecode. The rest is identical, so this is exact proof that, well, those two constructions, they generate exactly the same bytecode. Uh, so now you might imagine that if we write some filters of or some decompiler that tries to recognize try with resources, well, we could not because two source files, they do compile in exactly the same thing. Let's have a look on why uh, it needed to be compiled into this construction. So here is a try catch. In case of exception, we save the exception for later. We throw it again. And here is a finally block. In this finally block, if exception happened, then while we are closing it, we should attach one exception to another. Pretty simple. Without exception, well, we just close. If exception happens during the closing, we will just bu bu bubble it up. No need to attach it because there was no exception. What we could notice out of all this is that there is an old check which is dead code. We always initialize the resource. It could not be null. So fun fact, Java compiler generates a dead code. We could also notice that on, on a pass when finally is inlined into the catch block, there is also a dead code. It is pointless to check whether exception was there or not. It was. We know we are in a catch block. Again, dead code, compiler generates a dead code. It creates a trouble for tools which try to detect a dead code based on the bytecode. It creates a trouble for hand bugs, for example. Exactly the same uh, source file compiled with Java 9, but for Java 8, it generates a different bytecode. It generates a more compact code, so they tried to eliminate a dead code. They didn't really succeed it in version 9, but they succeeded later in Java 11, there is no more null checks. Now you can imagine how difficult it is to adopt to the different compiler versions. Well, if you would like to handle them all, you need to recognize already at least three patterns. Also Eclipse compiler, et cetera, et cetera. So this is exactly the way we went through. Uh, we need to filter try with resources. Well, we filter it. I hope now you've been warm it enough, and this is the time for Kotlin. Let's have a look on Kotlin. What happens in a Kotlin? In Kotlin, there is a data classes. Uh, everybody know Kotlin? Yes, no? Who does not? What? OK. OK, so let's also uh, me explain the Kotlin features. In Kotlin, there is a data classes. You basically say, well, this class is going to be data class. It's going to contain only data, no logic. Then you declare which data. So you declare the fields, and then magic happens. Which magic? Let's have a look. 
here is a field, here is a getter. We, there is no need to write getter, getter is going to be generated. It is not marked as synthetic, why? Because, well, for interoperability with Java, you need to be able to call the getter from the Java. So Kotlin compiler can't mark this method as synthetic. And of course, Kotlin is, an, is another language, so no need to follow the Java language specification. E even this, it says anything which is generated should be marked as synthetic. No need to follow it. Um, method setter, again, interrupt with Java. Constructor, method to string, again, not synthetic. A lot of bytecode in it. It constructs a pretty nice to string. Hash code equals. All of that appears during the analysis of the bytecode. But again, we need to trust the Kotlin compiler and we need to get rid of all that. Kotlin delegates. Um, putting it simply uh, a delegation pattern. So we would like to have a class um, which delegates uh, some methods to some implementation, but not for all of the methods. Some of the methods we would like to be able to overwrite. So in, in this case, the Rivet class uh, overrides uh, a method A, but all other methods, in particular method B, is going to be delegated to the base implementation. For that, again, Kotlin compiler generates something. So we could see here uh, the override, the method A. We could see the, of course, constructor. Uh, and we could see also generated method B which is not at all, again, marked as synthetic, which simply delegates to, to, to the implementation. This all needs to be filtered. We do filter this out. How it is filtered, an interesting thing, thing with the Kotlin is that in all of the cases when Kotlin compiler really generates some code from the, human, uh, from the code written by a human, it generates a line number table. You can see it. Oh, you couldn't actually. You could see it at the bottom. There is a line number table. Um, and in generated methods, there is no line number table. This is the only way in the Kotlin to distinguish generated methods from not generated ones. Um, the same is quite complicated with Java compiler because in Java compiler, you could disable the generation of line numbers. So line numbers do not help you at all analyze bytecode. Kotlin always generates line numbers. There is no way to disable that. So, well, we could also use that information. So need to filter it out. Another interesting construction in the Kotlin is um, default methods and such an annotation as GVM overloads. Um, sorry, not default methods, default arguments. You could declare default arguments for your method so that when you invoke this method with uh, less arguments that th than there is, uh, the defaults will be used. Pretty simple. Um, and, you, and you can use add GVM overloads annotation. In this uh, case, uh, Kotlin compiler, again, for interoperability with, with Java, it's going to generate you a methods with reduced numbers of arguments, which do call uh, this one substituting correct default arguments. How this is done, we could have a look. We again decompile it. Here is our original method. Uh, and here is a special helper method which is generated. It has a name, example, dollar $Default. Um, and we have two more methods with reduced number of arguments, one that accepts just in and the other one which doesn't accept any argument. Uh, this method, example default, it, it does just substitution. So it, it, it knows default arguments. It knows how many methods we are passing. And so it will substitute default arguments. And those two methods, they simply delegate to, to the one that was generated. And well, OK, we have also in here. Again, we need to filter all this out. That's what we do. Um, late in it, um, another interesting construction is a Kotlin. In the Kotlin is, is so-called late in it. Um, you might know or might not. In the Kotlin, there is uh, a nullability, which is a part of a type system. So. Fields could be nullable or not nullable, uh, could be of non-nullable or nullable types. In this case, we have a field x, which is of a type string, uh, which is not nullable. By default, all the types are not nullable. In order to make something nullable, you need to put a question mark in a Kotlin. Um, in some cases, um, it's, uh, we, we, and if, if, if the field is not nullable, 
it obviously should be initialized. Otherwise, well, there will be a null. Um, however, in some cases, uh, you really might want to have a non-nullable field, but you don't want to initialize it immediately. One of particular examples is unit tests. In unit tests, you do a preparation in a setup method, and then in a test, you use what you've just prepared. In this case, the initialization happens a little bit later than the uh, declaration of a field. That's why they introduced a late init annotation, which basically says, well, trust me, I'm going to initialize it, so it shouldn't be now. In the bytecode, it results in a pretty interesting thing. Uh, it results anyway in a null check. Anyway, there is a situation maybe you forgot to initialize. And in this case, it's not. It's not so nice to just uh, uh, crash with a null pointer exception. In, in this case, it, it is much more nicer to say to the user, well, the field X was not initialized. So you need to generate a null check. This adds a branches into your bytecode, which are completely invisible, which do not exist in your source code. Well, all this, again, needs to be filtered out. Fun fact, uh, IntelliJ IDEA, so the product of the same company which produces a Kotlin, they do also have a code coverage engine, and this code coverage engine not aware of a construction that their own compiler produces. So in particular, IntelliJ IDEA in this exact this case is telling us, well, there is a branch and you did not test it. Pretty funny. Um, another similar Pretty similar construction is Kotlin S operator, so call it unsafe cast. Um, why unsafe? Uh, yeah, let's stop here. Why, unsa why unsafe? Again, because everything can in the Kotlin either nullable or not nullable. And when you call some methods, you do not know. For example, you might call a, a Java method. So you do not know what you are calling. Uh, maybe you're calling something which actually would, at some moment of time, return you a null. And Kotlin as operator is, is basically a promise, well, I'm calling this method and I know that it does not return null. So I can cast it to the non-nullable type. But of course, again, all this needs to be checked. So here is a null check. And again, there is a nice exception which says, well, at some moment of time, at runtime, you, go, you promise it, but you got a null. And null cannot be casted to non null type. Again, we need to filter all this out. Um, on this slide, you have a bug ticket. Uh, however, while preparing the slides, uh, I fixed this problem. So in a master, it's filtered out. Um, same fun fact, IntelliJ not aware of those branches. Um, in Kotlin, there is when expressions and uh, there is also enums. So you might already guess when behaves the same way as a switch, enum behaves the same way as enum. So you also might probably guess that, well, the same thing is going to be generated a switch map for the same reasons because enum could change. What is, however, interesting with Kotlin is that in Java, you must write a default case. Kotlin allows you to not write default case uh, when you list all values of enumeration, like like in this example. In Java, Java, Java compiler would, would tell us, well, you need to have a default because you have an unhandled cases, potentially. Um, Kotlin has a better static analysis, so it determines we covered all the switch cases. We do not need uh, the default. Unfortunately, this is not the case in the bytecode. In the bytecode, we, we still need to generate default. So what we see in the bytecode, again, indeed, we see uh, you know, map. This time it's called differently, so the same filter doesn't work for the Kotlin. You need to adapt for the Kotlin code. Uh, we indeed see first case, we see the second case, and bam, we see the third case. In the bytecode, we couldn't simply fall out of the method if, if there is a default. We need to generate this default. What if somehow in runtime you get enum, for example, deserialize it from somewhere where it has far more cases than you handle it? So here is a default case. It, it anyway exists. Again, it throws a nice exception, which is, well, there is no such branch in, in, in the one in your code. Again, all this needed to be filtered out. 
when plus string. Guesses? Well, when is a switch, string is a string. Pretty simple. Uh, again, probably based on the hash code, like it's logical. What's interesting in Kotlin? In Kotlin, yes, here is a hash code, here is a switch, here is first case, here is second case. There is no more second switch like it was with JVAC. Kotlin compiler is a little bit smarter here, pretty much like Eclipse compiler. It's enough to generate one switch and then quickly decide, do the comparisons and quickly decide which case it is. So a little bit smaller byte code generated by Kotlin compiler. And again, well, the filters that you wrote for uh, to recognize the switch on a string value is not going to work for this case because it's completely different byte code. So again, need to write one more case. Again, fun fact, IntelliJ not aware about uh, switches by strings. Inline. Uh, inline is final, I believe, example that I'm going to show you today. Pretty interesting beast in the Kotlin. In Kotlin, you could mark uh, methods, functions as inline. Uh, it literally says, well, at the call site, at the place where this invocation is going to happen, please put an exact duplicate of a body of what I'm calling. Really, literally duplicated here. So we have two call sites. We call the same method twice, the method market as in line. And what happens in a bytecode? Well, here is first copy. Here is the second copy. How to filter that? Uh, not so clear. Uh, however, there is a statement that um, there is a mapping back to the original lines, which is in a special format in GSR 45, um, which, is, which was developed a long time ago uh, for GSP, actually, to map uh, the, the bytecode generated for GSP pages, to map it back on GSP pages from which it was generated. Um, unfortunately, we, we did not yet implement anything uh, to recognize that. Conclusion. Um, conclusion is pretty simple. Uh, please, 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 please be aware that the source code is not the byte code. What is actually going to be executed is not what you've wrote. Furthermore, it's going to be a surprise, but furthermore, the bytecode is not what is going to be actually executed. There is a JIT. JIT is going to JIT your bytecode into the native code and execute the native code. But even this is untrue. Because there is a processor. Processor is going to look on a native code and going to do a branch prediction and say, well, I believe this branch is executed. I execute it. So not even a JITed code is executed, but something by the processor. But even this is untrue. Why? Because electrons, they just pretend that they move over cables. They don't. Well, second thing, bytecode-based tools have to guess, have to make the best guesses. There is no other way. There is no magical silver bullet that will decompile the bytecode into the source code. Now that you are aware of that, please don't scream that much that Huntbox finds some dead code, because it really finds it, because compilers do generate the dead code. Well, yeah, so we need to live with that. Uh, we as developers of, of a tools need to live with this, somehow adopt to that. And we as, as a, again, developers of this, as a users of these tools, need to live with that. And that's it. That's the end. Uh, thank you for your attention. We still have quite some time, so if you have any questions, I hope there will be a microphone and you can ask them. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, thanks for your uh, good uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to ask how about cartoons and what uh, they are compiled in and how you filter once. Uh, could you please repeat how uh, about... Coroutines. Uh, coroutines. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, okay. Well, coroutines went uh, out of uh, release candidate just recently. So it was pretty useless to follow into what they compiled because this was changing. However, indeed, I follow it a little bit. Coroutines are compiled into a state machine. So coroutines, they, on a place of suspension, you, you, you go out, you save the state where you was, bam. And when, when, uh, when you need to come back after suspension, you just return to the same place. So it's a big switch, let's say, a big switch, ma switch machine. That's it. And indeed, uh, this also needs to be recognized, that otherwise you would indeed see the, the state machine and not at all the original coroutine. Some other questions? Yeah, well, okay, probably better in, in this order. <laughs> Sorry, uh, there is. Um, a lot of things is guessing right now. You, uh, you mentioned about that. Is there any hope to do this more in Sigiliza? No, guess, guessing in a sense that, uh, well, it is an ad hoc approach because. Uh, the generated byte code, there is no spec which says, well, do like that. Th there is no specification. There is only implementation. So, for example, uh, Java compiler version, as we've seen, version 8 decides to, elimin uh, to not eliminate that code in try with resources and generate a such byte code. And there is no at all guarantee that they would not change that because it's not spe specified. So, for the when when nine was not there, we make our best guess that well, this is the pattern that we would always see the in the bytecode, and based on this pattern, we would recognize try with resources. But this is the best guess because in version nine, bam, pattern changes, and you need to adapt to that. Is there an is there any hope that in the future, the way how you analyze the code will look um, totally different in more you know, predictable way, uh, not need to... Quantum computers, up. maybe. <laughs> uh, well, the thing is that uh, pretty much the same as uh, with hash fun. Basically, you could see compiler as a hash function from the source code to the byte code. Yeah, yeah. So two source codes, we also see, seen that. Two source code, they could easily compile into the same byte code. So in general case, task is unsolvable because we have the byte code which of two source codes uh, it was. Um, try with resources is not so interesting example because, well, probably nobody would write such a crazy source code. So the chances that, uh, that uh, we should show to the user that, well, this was this source code is pretty low. It probably was a try with resources. Mm -hmm. However, there is many other examples. Uh, in particular, it's possible to construct example where Loop is is not distinguish uh, for loop is not you wouldn't be able to distinguish for loop from a while loop. Okay. That's why decompilation and that's why it's pretty uh, hard to write the decompilers and that's why actually decompilers they, they never give you original source code. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about the GVM options and generated methods with defaults. Uh, what if we want to create our own method with a uh, signature which will be generated by the uh, compiler? Is it possible? Uh, once again, uh, we are we talking about Kotlin, uh, uh, GVM yeah. overloads, uh, default arguments. Uh, yeah, when we have the method with default values, GVM options, and uh, compiler will, will gener generate all possible uh, method with uh, the default values, what if we want to manually uh, create the method with our own uh, implementation? Well, um, then you don't use uh, default arguments in Kotlin and you don't use uh, GVM overloads annotation, you write your, your code by hands. Okay. This is going to work. <laughs> um, I do not know 
why I'm answering like this? Because, well, I do not know why you would like to do so, because uh, the feature in a language was designed to be used as, as, as like this and not the other way around. Um, what do they generate is, uh, the, uh, in a Kotlin, you, when you call in methods, you could uh, specify arguments uh, by their name. It's pretty handy uh, because in case of default arguments, you might have, I don't know, 10 arguments, you could specify any of them in, in various different combinations. What they're gonna generate out of at GVM overloads annotation is not that flexible. Why? Because, uh, well, in a Java language, you could not name arguments. So the only thing that they could generate is basically stripping from the back one by one arguments and reducing them down. That's why they, they did the, the best, the max, I guess. Again, I guess because I'm not a developer of Kotlin. You better ask them. Uh, that's why I guess they generated like they generated. Um, if you would like to to implement uh, uh, your variant of loading default arguments, you, you kind of won't be because the method which contains the default arguments, uh, it's synthetic, so you could not call it. You couldn't write the source code that, that will call it. However, you could easily have uh, an overloaded methods. So for example, next to the method which accepts defaults, you could also write the methods that accept just one argument. And of course, then compiler is not going to generate the method which accepts one argument because you've wrote it explicitly. So I hope it covers all yeah, the yeah. possible cases. Uh, we still have something like two minutes. But don't worry, I will be there. You can catch me. We can cop can talk about languages, GVMs, whatever you want. Uh, do you have some uh, examples you shared with us, uh, like you know, official documentation on something like that? Because until you described the problem, it was not so obvious. And uh, once uh, while I have a requirement to have 100% uh, coverage, unless you didn't say branch coverage or method coverage. Um. I hope I get it right. Uh, do we have documentation of Some what? Some official uh, web page, for example, to show with managers, to describe the problem you... Ah, okay, about. so first thing first, if you talk about code coverage and managers, never ever, please, 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 do not show code coverage metric to the managers, okay? They already know about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite hard to, to, to make them forget this. Um, well, we, we do not have, uh, what we do have, we have uh, in Jekoko, we do have a change log. In a change log, we write, well, we filter at this, we filter at that. Uh, there is a link on the pull request or on issue, and if you click on this link, there is a screenshot which, so, which showing uh, the problem, and there is uh, analysis of the problem, and there is uh, uh, result afterwards. So somehow we do list the cases that we fix it. Of course, unfortunately, not in documentation. Uh, we have a dream to generate the specific page because reading change log is, is tough. Um, but this open source project, uh, this is a part-time project. So, well, we don't yet have the time to do that. Uh, if you can and would like to do a contribution, you are more than welcome. Um, and of course, the cases about which we are not aware, we could not write. So if you come across such a case and some manager, I don't know, or your tech lead, uh, I hope not, is asking you, well, cover that branch, but you're like looking at the source code, I could not? Well, now you know, you run the decompiler and you show to this guy, well, in the bytecode, uh, the branch exists, tool analyzes the bytecode, but not the source code. Let's trust the compiler, but I did it wrong. And you report the case to us. That's exactly how we found, uh, I don't know, 30 persons of those cases. I'm not a Kotlin developer at all. People are coming because they are saying, well, something strange happens here, and we investigate. And we run out of time, so maybe we can accept one more question if there is, if there is no. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs>